The PlayStation 1 has a characteristic and beloved visual style that we all want to replicate in 2025 for some reason. I love it. Horror games get way more scary, in my opinion. Plus, it saves you a ton of time in creating high-quality models. You can actually just create low-poly, which is great. Ace Roller created the best video on the topic, and my video is not gonna top his. But the thing is, his video is more generic and focuses more on the math behind it. My video is gonna be more hands-on Godot learning. This is the final scene we get. I hope you like it. Just quickly before we get in, I want to tell you about a great way to learn programming. Brilliant. I love Brilliant because it tackles my biggest problem. I like to learn theory, but I never apply it in practice. In Brilliant, you have courses in programming, math, and data, and they're all going to be hands-on problem solving. All lessons are interactive, and this method has proven to be six times more effective than watching lectures. It's also perfect for developing a daily learning habit that fits your routine, and you can also learn on the go because you have the mobile app. So if you want to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash freddy or scan the QR code on the screen. You can also click the link in the description. By the way, you will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thank you Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Before you import any assets into your game, go to project settings, enable advanced settings, and look for texture. Set the default texture filter to nearest. The PS1 had no filtering in its textures. That's why they all looked very pixelated. Another thing you can change is go into import defaults, go into texture 2D. The tech 3D should be set to disabled because if you enable this at all, it's going to change this and enable map mapping, which the PS1 didn't support. This is also kind of optional. If you don't want to do this, it's fine. And while we're here, we can also change the shading. So if you look for vertex and go into shading, you can force vertex shading. This option didn't work before Godot 4.4, but now it works. A little fun fact is that I found a bug when testing this before it was merged into the official Godot branch. Can we really say that this is only working because of me? No, of course not. I'm kidding. All the credits go to this amazing person here. Anyway, you can click on save and restart. All right, so this is what our scene looks like right now. We have Harry Mason from Silent Hill and a simple floor. The first thing that stands out on the PlayStation 1 is the resolution. Technically, the PlayStation 1 could output 480p, but that would be using all the limits of the PlayStation. So games used a much smaller resolution. So if you want to stay historically accurate, you're probably going to use something that is under 320 by 240. Simply go to project settings, window, and change this to 320 by 240. And keep in mind that this resolution is 4 by 3. We're going to cover aspect ratios in a bit. Scroll down and make the mode viewport. So this is going to stretch the image. All right, let's restart this. And there you go, this is the PlayStation 1 resolution. Particularly, I think it looks way too pixelated. So I prefer 640 by 480. Personally, this is enough pixelation for me. Obviously, the best solution here is to leave this up to the player of your game, but as a default, I would use 480 in my game. Now, let's talk about aspect ratio because personally, I don't like the black bars in my game. So if you change aspect from keep to keep height, your game is going to stretch to any aspect ratio, but it's always going to be 480p height. If I make this floating on the next, play, I can actually stretch this to any width and any height. Personally, I think this is the best option to give your players, but you could also make an option in the menu to choose the aspect ratio they want if they like a more authentic experience. It is time to create the post-processing effects, and I'm talking about color quantization and dithering. And in case you're wondering, why didn't I create pixelation as a post-processing effect? The answer is because Shader pixelation has no performance benefits. Actually rendering your game in a lower resolution will give you more performance. If something looks bad, it should probably run well. Anyway, that's why I did that. Let's create a shaders folder and let's add to our scene a canvas layer and a color rectangle. Then click this and select full rectangle. This is gonna make the color cover the whole screen. Go to your color rectangle, go to material, Give it a new shader material in the new shader, save it into our folder and call this ES1 post process. And this is what you're going to see. We're not going to need vertex or light functions, only this. Okay, so now we need to get the screen texture, which is just going to get the correct pixels of our screen so we can work with that in our fragment shader. For that, we just need 
a screen texture. So this is just a uniform, which is like a variable in the shader. And we're using the hint screen texture to automatically get the screen texture, no repeating and using the nearest neighbor filter. So it looks more pixelated. Now we're just changing the actual fragment shaders color to the texture and the regular UV. So if we play this now, we are simply seeing the scene because the color rectangle is just displaying the scene again, <laughs> a second time. The first effect we're going to create is color quantization. The PlayStation one, could handle only around 33,000 colors compared to like 16 million we have today. Because nowadays we give each color channel eight bits. So like the red, for example, can have a value of zero to 255. In the PlayStation one, that would go from zero to 31 for each channel. That's around 33,000 colors. We first get the screen color and we disregard the alpha value, which is transparency, because we're only gonna change the RGB. We then create another variable called quantize color, which is the equation I saw on Ace Roller's video. We take the screen color and we multiply it by 255. The reason for this is because colors in shaders are represented from zero to one. So we're taking this zero to one range and again, making it zero to 255. And then we divide it by eight, essentially putting it in the range from zero to 31. We floor this value, which is just going to make it go from a float to an integer to the nearest integer. And then we divide everything by 31 and that's going to bring it back to the zero to one range. Now, all we need to do is put it in our color. But remember we made it a vector three. We disregarded the alpha value because we want the alpha value to always be one. So let's make it a vector four again here and give it an alpha of one. If we play our scene now, you're going to notice that the sky has color bending. The gradients are not as smooth anymore because we have less colors. And yes, this is what the PS1 could work with. The next effect is called dithering. This was actually used to fight against the color bending we saw. Dithering is a very old technique and it's been around for a long time. Imagine you only had red and white and you wanted to create pink. You could create very tiny dots in your paper and your eye would actually blend in those dots and see pink. So your eye would be creating a color that isn't there. That is what dithering is used for. But since the PS1's resolution is so low, you actually see big dots on your screen. So the effect is not that powerful in the PS1, but on a CRT screen, you can bet that was enough. Let's start off by getting the PS1 dithering pattern. This is a 4x4 four four matrix. I'm not the expert here. I saw this from Ace Rolla, so I'm just trying to replicate what he did. He has an entire video on dithering if you want to know more about it. You can simp simply think of this as a matrix that has values of brightness that we're going to change our pixels into. And this is going to repeat across the screen. This particular matrix is actually used by the PlayStation 1. So this is very faithful to the original. So the next Next thing we do is grab our pixel position. So frag coordinate is the coordinate of the fragment. Thus it is the pixel. We're using mod four. So it repeats every four pixels. We're doing the same thing for the Y value. This is the part where it's going to represent our pixel in this grid. Next up, we create the dither offset. This is going to scale the values down. So the change in brightness is very subtle. This is where we actually go look into the dither matrix and find out where our pixel should be within that matrix. So it's actually going to go in here and find out which one of these values of brightness our pixel needs. And finally, we just add this into our quantized color before we floor it. If we run this scene now, you're going to notice that the color bending is gone. And if you look really closely, you're going to notice some dots in the screen. The reason the dots are not as noticeable as they were on the PS1 is because of resolution. If I simply turn down the resolution once again to our PS1 accurate resolution, you're going to realize that the dithering pattern is much clearer. We can actually emulate this in a shader, making sure that the dithering pattern uses a virtual resolution of 320 by 240, regardless of your screen resolution, making the dithering pattern really, really obvious. But this is very optional. If you want to stay true to the purpose of dithering, this is not something you would do. This is specifically for people who want to make their game more dithery. So we need a uniform here. It's a vector two, and this is going to be the viewport 
size. And I'm going to set it equal to VEC2 640 by 480. This goes without saying that this is not going to update automatically if you decide to change your project settings later. So you probably need to create a script that's going to change this to the actual viewport size. I'm not going to teach it here because it goes beyond of the scope of this tutorial. It's actually quite easy and your game might be using like custom viewports. So yeah, this is very dependent on your game. Just know that this value here should be the size of your actual viewport. Now we're going to need a uniform to represent our virtual resolution. Just so we can change this later if we want to. Now we simply go down here and replace this with this. We get our virtual position within our virtual resolution. Uh, I, I don't know why this is here. And the rest stays the same. Now when we run this, you're going to notice that even though we're running at 480p, the dithering pattern is really aggressive. Now let's go to the most famous quirk on the PlayStation 1, the vertex wobbling. For this, we're going to create a shader that has to be applied to each of our models individually. So let's go to Harry here. Let's go to Geometry, Material Override, and let's change this into a new shader material. Let's create a new shader here. Into the shaders folder, we can actually name this to PlayStation 1 Models. This time around, we're going to use both Vertex and Fragment. First of all, let's give Harry his texture back by creating a uniform sampler 2D called Albedo Texture and give it the filter nearest just in case. In the Fragment shader, we can actually change Albedo to Texture, Albedo Texture, UV, dot RGB. If you need transparency, change this into a VEC4 called Albedo. Albedo, please. You're going to store the entire texture. And in here, you're going to use albedo.rgb and alpha. Oops, alpha is albedo.a. So in our shader parameters, we can now provide a texture. Just grabbing the Harry Mason texture here. Now you're going to notice two problems with this. The first one being that the model is overlapping itself. And the second one being that the color looks washed out and white. First of all, add these render modes in just to make sure. Vertex lighting is just to make sure that it's using vertex lighting. Specular is because PS1 normally didn't have speculars. It also didn't have shadows. This is fixing our thing there where the model would overlap itself. And call disabled can actually be called back if you want. This is simply going to make the back faces transparent and not actually render them. The second thing is that our albedo texture needs the hint source color alongside filter nearest. Nice. Okay, so let's continue with our vertex wobble. <laughs> wobble is so fun to say. This happened because the PlayStation 1 couldn't calculate the position of vertices using floating point numbers. So they actually rounded everything to an integer, making the vertices snap around the integers. It's especially complicated to do this in a shader because you have to convert the vertex position into NDC, which is normalized device coordinates. Sure, for people who are used to working with shaders, this is pretty standard stuff. But as a newbie, this was the hardest part of the challenge to me. Let's start by creating a couple of simple uniforms here. The first one is just going to enable or disable pixel snapping. And the second one is the resolution of the grid in which the vertices are going to snap to. The smaller this value, the more aggressive the effect will look. In this section, we're converting the vertex position, which is right here, into a view space, which is what the camera sees, and then into clip space. Clip space is the actual, like, pixel coordinates where the vertex will be. If I'm butchering any of this, go watch Ace Roller's video. It goes into much more detail. And now this is the code that converts from clip space to NDC space. Again, Ace Roller explained this, like, every little step of this equation. But essentially what you need to know is that this is where we're using the snap resolution. This is where the magic happens. We are multiplying the, pos the actual vertex position into a resolution and then rounding it to the nearest grid point. So this is where the magic happens. And this is simply converting this back into clip space. And the reason we do this is because the position is in clip space. So now we only need to change the position as a clip space. We don't need to convert it back to vertex space. So essentially what this part of the code is doing is changing the position of the vertex of each vertex, of course, in our model and snapping it into the nearest point of our grid. 
that's how you can think about it. And this one, we don't have to even be running the game to notice. If I just move around, you see that the vertices are wobbling. You can see that the shadow is going crazy. Well, I don't know what the reason for this is, but the point is PS1 didn't even have shadows. So if we apply our shader to the floor by simply creating a new shader material, using quick load to find our PlayStation 1 models shader and giving it its albedo back, which is right here, we no longer see a shadow because our models won't have shadows. Oh yeah, this reminds me of texture tiling. That's because we need to implement something called UV tiling. You can create a uniform here, vector three and call it texture tile. Just set it to vector three, one, one, one. Just go to UV and multiply it by texture tile. Oh yeah, I forgot this is actually a VEC2. Silly me. Anyway, as we increase these values, this is how you tile textures. I don't remember how it was set up. I'm just going to go 4-4 four, four here. A little less because for some reason it's stretching. And this is our scene with texture wobble. And again, you can change the snap resolution here if you don't want the snapping to be so strong. The final but definitely still important effect is a fine texture mapping. The PlayStation 1 didn't account for perspective when mapping the textures to the models. This would create the distortion that you see in many textures in the PlayStation 1. We need a variable to define the weight so we can control how much of fining we want. We're also going to need these three variables to keep track of values. So we're going to we're going to define these values in the vertex function and then we're going to need them again in the fragment function. That's why we're creating variables for them. The first value is clip W, which is just the clip space W value. Again, if you need to know these things and how they work exactly, go to Ace Roller. <laughs> a fine is just the version of the UV, but with a fine applied to it. And perspective is just the normal version. You may notice that I am multiplying by texture tile here, so we don't need to do this down here anymore. So this is the version of the UV with a fine texture mapping, and this is the regular version of the UV with just some tiling. And so down in the fragment shader is where we take the UV of fine and divide it by clip W and mix everything, including the weight in the final. So we take the final UV and we paste it here. Now it turned, it became small because of tiling. Okay. Don't forget this. It's not because of a fine, but now when I move the camera around, you're going to notice some texture warping. So you may be asking yourself, I never saw this level of distortion on the PS1. The reason for this is because PS1 games tried to avoid this as much as they could. Some games used fixed camera positions like this. So if you don't move the camera, you're not going to notice the warping. And some games even subdivided the polygons. If I took this simple plane here in Blender and I added more polygons to it, the warping effect would be minimized. The point is you should also do that. Either use fixed camera angles or make your models a little bit higher poly count. You can even see that in Harry here, he still uses texture warping, but it's barely noticeable for him. And this, my friends, is the final scene using every one of the restrictions of the PlayStation 1 era. If you want a video on VHS,